Okay, so. <coughs> Sure, the okay. So the question starts that <coughs> you were speaking today about caring for others, looking after their well-being, and you are often involved in social justice issues. So what is our responsibility as Buddhists, particularly those of us in the Theravada tradition, to address the ethnic cleansing then brackets genocide in Myanmar, which is being promoted and committed in the name of Buddhism. I do have to say that this is like one of the biggest stains on the name of Buddhism in the contemporary world. In fact, it's one of the, not only stains on the name of Buddhism, but it's one of the stains of, on humanity in the present world. So what is our responsibility? to address the ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. Okay, there is a friend of mine, his name is Alan Sinauki. He is in, living in, in Berkeley. And he has established an organization which is attempting to provide assistance to the Rohingya people who are living now, most of them in Bangladesh, some roughly I think 800,000 or up to a million people are live, of Rohingya are living in Bangladesh because of the ethnic cleansing that took place in the Rakhine state in Myanmar. Um, there have been occasionally, like there are demonstrations on behalf of the Rohingya. There was one just a few days ago, last week, in New York. Um, so if one is able to participate in that, in such demonstrations, then one could do so. And I believe that there is an organization of Burmese Buddhists living in, in, in New York, or the greater New York area, who are committed to promoting justice for the Rohingya people. They use an acronym Sada, which is the Buddhist word for faith, so it's S-A-D-D-H-A. -D -D and probably, even though they are people of, Bur primarily people of Burmese descent, who are working for justice for the Rohingya people, but if one contacts them and finds out how you could assist them as allies of their movement, or even join their movement, their organization, one should try to do so. Um, what I've read recently is that the Rohingya are even afraid, even though the Burmese government has been making overtures to bring them back into Myanmar and resettle them in their original, in their the region where they, that they have been occupying, the state of Rakhine, but they say that they don't feel trust, they don't feel safe enough to go back to, to the Rakhine state, to Myanmar, because they're afraid that the same thing is going to happen again. Yeah, this is just, I mean, it's a complete travesty of the Burmese Buddhists claim to be following, but at least the Burmese governments claim to be following the teachings of the Buddha. Okay, regarding a harmless occupation, what about casino, the gaming industry? Let's say I work as an analyst and my boss asks us to make an analysis whether or not to open another one in a certain neighborhood. Is that bad karma? I won't speak from the standpoint of karma, but I have to you know, give my opinion that casinos and gambling, I would consider them forms of wrong livelihood for those who are opening the casinos and running the casinos. Though I don't want to you know, put 
to blame and say if there are people who are in need of livelihood and they get a job working in the casino, you know, doing just regular like maintenance work. I doubt in that case that we would consider that wrong livelihood on their part, especially if jobs are very, uh, very difficult to find employment. But those who are running the casinos and making them, making their living off the casino, um, yeah, I would say that that is a form of wrong livelihood. And if one is working as an analyst. Okay, and your boss, I guess an analyst, not directly working in the casino industry, but some other occupation, some other kind of it's a, a kind of facility that undertakes analyses in many different areas, not confined to casinos, but you get the assignment to make an analysis whether or not to open the casino in a certain neighborhood. I would suggest that on ethical grounds you protest to your boss and say that I don't think casinos are an ethical occupation and I would prefer not to be involved in this type of analysis. Please give me another assignment. Can you provide an example of how one would apply these teachings, I guess these ethical teachings, in business? Okay, what I would say is that one should conduct one's business. I don't have business experience, so um, <laughs> my personal opinion maybe is not, I can't provide, let's say, a lot of information about, the, about this. But I would say that one should, of course, always conduct one's business honestly. It's part of the necessities of running a business to make some profit. So you have to aim to make a profit, but not aiming at maximizing profit, but making what we might call a fair profit, ensuring that one gets the materials that one needs in conducting the business, assuming it's the business involves the input of raw materials, then you get it through fair labor practices on the part of those who are supplying the materials, that one treats one's workers, um, that you provides them with adequate compensation, more than adequate compensation for their, um, for their work, provides them with the various benefits that too often are denied, that they get a certain amount of few weeks of vacation every, every year, that they're not expected to work excessive hours, that if they do work overtime that they get fair payment for their overtime work. Again, that one deals honestly with the customers, make sure that the goods that one is selling um, measure up to the claims that are made about them, that one, again, regarding the workers, I guess that one provides them with adequate health insurance. Perhaps there are people here with <laughs> much more business experience than I have that could um, provide additional insights on this. Does anybody else here with some business experience have ideas about what could be added to what I said? <laughs> oh, I, I did. Uh, I just want to give a reference about using the, this uh, Buddhism uh, in the Venice. So there is a famous. They speak more than uh, uh, There is a famous um, Jap Jap Japanese uh, um, Venice man. I forgot his name, but he's very, very famous. So he actually uh, started two companies. Uh, uh, the most company was the 500. Fortune 500. Both two companies are in their list and very successful. 
So he uses uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, Buddhism. He uses Buddhist principles. In, in the banks. Mm. Um, Do you know the names of the companies? Uh, because I read the book in the summer. It's mm. in Chinese, so. Mm. Um, in Chinese, the name is Dao Sheng Ke Fu. Dao Sheng Ke He kind of, he's very old now, and he's, he kind of wants to become monk. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there's there's a period in Odin, um, but he stepped back. I think um, to, to work more with them, and he stuff a lot of a uh, workshop for in the world mm -hmm. uh, to teach his kind. Mm -hmm. so. Is there certain new questions? Yeah, I see that. Okay, in all seriousness, why do all the verses end with the line, this is the highest blessing? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's just the structure of the poem, but actually... <laughs> you see, the verses that we've been going through haven't yet really come to the highest blessing. So they're, these are, in a way, provisional or preparatory blessings, but I don't know. <laughs> it's just a poem is a poem. You wouldn't want to say, this is a provisional, <laughs> this is a provisional <laughs> blessing. I, I had a question about that. Do you, earlier when you were talking about memorization, do you think some of the early writings, it has that repetition to aid with the memory. Oh, definitely, I'd say a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the repetition within the text themselves is included there because in order to assist with memorization. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's a question, how much of this, I would imagine that the Buddha himself in giving discourses used a fair amount of repetition, but maybe not as much as we find in the actual text. It was probably the text included more repetition in order to assist those who were responsible for transmitting them by memory. Okay, what if one is in the middle of a contentious protest for a social justice issue? Is this the right or wrong time to bring this disagreement? I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. Okay, what if one is, maybe we'd say, what if one is in the middle of an argument over a social justice issue? If the person who wrote the question wants to elaborate or clarify. You did. <laughs> Um, I guess what I was asking was um, when you go, like a lot of the, when you're out there, you yeah. know, with these, you know, uh, events, yeah. these protests, whatever, um, um, when you're saying the right time to, you know, there's a right, you know, the right time to bring, um, to bring the help, you know, to bring that sort of disagreement, you know, the time to sort of bring these things up. And so I guess the question was just, I was just wondering, like, um, there doesn't seem to be a way to avoid that, like, you know, is, you know, at all, like you're in the middle of it, and yeah. the time is the time, or yeah. is that not the time? Oh, I see. You because, know what I mean? So that's what I could you know, Because of what I said earlier about <laughs> finding the right time to speak, right, speaking right, at the right, right time. time. Right. <laughs> um, you could protest the right time for disagreement. 
yeah, if it's the time where the protests on the social justice, if it is a time that calls for a protest on a social justice issue, then it's the right time to go out and protest on behalf of that issue. What's meant by the right time for right, the right time for speaking, that is the way I understand it, to speak to somebody at a time where it will not sort of cause them discomfort, to cause them embarrassment and humiliation in front of other people. But if when one feels that it's the right time to address a particular social justice issue, then one has to go forth and sort of stand up on behalf of that issue. That's my understanding. Okay, so those are the questions in the box. Then there are a couple of newer ones. In the sutra, why should the marriage be arranged by parents? Why a female housewife, there is difference between husband and wife? Okay, as to why the marriage is arranged by the parents, this was a tradition in India from, I don't know when the tradition began, but it has been a tradition in Indian culture from, certainly from the time of the Buddha, probably centuries earlier, down to the present day. Maybe it, this custom is starting to disintegrate in favor of love marriages, but this was the custom. This was the custom, that's all I can say. And what I've been told by people in Sri Lanka that, at least from the older generation, that they actually like that system, even though they married within the bounds of that system, but they found that it leads to more loving relationships between husband and wife over the long term. <laughs> I'm not advocating for this, <laughs> for this system here. But it leads to sort of more stable, loving relationships between the husband and the wife than love marriages, which too often the emotional love sort of fades away after time, and then the bond, the marital bond, disintegrates. This is just what I was told. I'm not an advocate. You're shaking your hands as though. I don't think there were, I mean, I don't know why I go out there like I think in the West, that notion of that romantic love, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying there should be arranged marriages, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I think you're right, a lot of times there's a misconception or this idea of romantic love, and when you take some of the universal characteristics of impermanence, yeah. Yeah. and then that change, and then people... That is actually probably so. Yeah, yeah. Concept, and yeah. Thank you, man. I felt like I was on the hot yeah, yeah, seat. Yeah. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with arranged marriage because I think most parents traditionally ask their child's consent also. That is true. That is true. It's not like they're being forced into the marriage. Yes. But they will bring like the pair the I guess there'll be some acquaintance between like one family and another family. They have acquaintance and they see, they know that their children are roughly in the same age group. And then they'll have some discussions about the prospects for the marriage. Then they'll bring the prospective husband and the prospective wife together, you know, to spend some time together in order to see how they get along. And then they'll consult with them whether they feel that the marriage will work. And then if they agree to that, then the marriage will take place. But probably I'd say in 99% of the cases, if one of them says, no, I don't want to marry that person, then the parents will say, okay, we'll search for another partner. Yeah. Um, so I ask these questions, I want to clarify my purpose. Um, so it's very interesting that you mentioned that 
more and more people choose love marriage, and the divorce rate is very high. Well, With the love marriage. Yes, nowadays. Yeah. But before, kind of, the marriage is stable, but also, but people suffer. So what I want people suffer within the marriage. <laughs> but they are very responsible. Like yeah. Um, so yeah. my question is, um, um, I think is, uh, what's the Buddha's teaching about the marriage? Uh, what's Buddha's intention? Like um, the teaching for the for the time of here now. <laughs> I think the principles would be the same. Like the Buddha was giving these teachings against the background of a culture in which arranged marriage was the dominant form of marriage. And actually it just occurred to me that the Buddha's own marriage was not completely an arranged marriage, at least according to the traditional account. Let me see if I can remember it. It was actually the woman who became his wife who chose the husband, if I remember. Do you remember this? If I remember, it was Yasodhara. That's the woman who became the Buddha's wife. She must have been like a prize princess. And so there were a number of like the young aristocrats from the, they wanted to marry, she was from the Kolian clan, and the Buddha was from the Shakyan clan. They were on opposite sides of a river, the Rohini River, in the area that's now sort of bordering, combining India and Nepal. And so the families wanted to combine the Kolians and the Sakyans, and so there was a kind of tournament, and Yasodhara was like the judge at the tournament, and the different Sakyan youths would perform the athletic feats and wrestling, whatever. And then she was to choose of the youths the one that appealed the most to her. And of course she chose the young Siddhartha, and then they became husband and wife. Okay, so if the Buddha was living today and giving guidance for marriage in our own culture, I would assume the principles would be pretty much the same, that the marriage should be founded upon a shared, whether it's with Buddhists or non-Buddhists, but a shared commitment to ethical values, to love and respect between husband and wife, based on their personal qualities, um, reverence for spiritual values and a commitment to well to properly bringing up their children in an ethical way that's what i would do guess is a few factors okay, then why female housewife why is there this difference between a husband and wife again these are the traditional roles and a marital relationship in ancient India and probably in Western culture, maybe right up to recent times, where if the woman was expected to look after the household, take care of the children, see that everything is in proper order within the household, <laughs> and the husband goes out and works at this time, that time he probably was not traveling far, but he would be running a business or looking after the fields where cultivation was taking place, working the fields himself. If a farmer, if a merchant, then he might even be going on distant trips. And so the wife would stay at home and look after the children and the rest of the household. Does weed or LSD count as <laughs> in 
intoxicants. Weed becomes legal in some states and people think of it as a herbal, a herbal substance given by nature. <laughs> I have to say, I have to put LSD in brackets since I'm not sure that it would count as an intoxicant. I think, certainly I, I would think cannabis would count as an intoxicant since it does sort of affect the clarity of the mind and it would lead to probably perceptual distortions. And if somebody is maybe driving under the influence of, of cannabis, it could lead to automobile accidents and the person can be maybe careless. I mean, I have confession, I grew up in the generation <laughs> that did use weed. And so I do have experience. <laughs> but it goes back, like what? <laughs> 58 years? No, no, not, 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 56 years, something like that. So my recollection of its effect is a little bit cloudy. <laughs> Clouds of smoke going up. <laughs> okay, but the fact that it's provided by nature doesn't mean that, and the fact that it's legalized in some states doesn't mean that it's not an intoxicant. I mean, Liquor is legal in the country and it's, in a sense, provided, at least the raw materials are provided by nature. So that doesn't decommission its status as an intoxicant. So I would say certainly marijuana does cause intoxication. Um, I would say, though, that my opinion that Cannabis is not as harmful as alcohol to the person's <laughs> own body and in their relationships with other people. It doesn't lead to that kind of violent, destructive behavior that liquor can lead to. And I think it's not as addicting as alcohol is. Okay, so this takes care of the written questions, so we still have some time for... Okay, please, yeah. Have you, are you familiar with any of the research that's being done on psilocybin and LSD in terms of using it in a therapeutic setting? People have been talking about how it can... They say that it can dissolve the ego. During and it can these, dissolve the ego. During these trips and really change the way the mind works. It, it seems like that. Yeah. Shortcut to. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar. I don't know about that research, but I remember. <laughs> I remember, like I grew up in, again <laughs> in the days when. Let's see if I get the names right. Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, and who's now Ram Das, and Ralph. Metzner. And actually, they were conducting these experiments, should we call them experiments, in upper New York State with young people. They had, I think, a kind of mansion in upstate New York. I believe it was Millbrook, New York, close to where I'm living. <laughs> conducting these experiments and then on the basis of these experiments, they were saying that LSD dissolves the ego and leads to a kind of egoless state. Even they would think of it as a state of enlightenment. And then they published a book, the three of them together, called The Psychedelic Experience, which they modeled on the Tibetan book, the book that's called The Tibetan Book of the Dead. 
Okay, but what I would say is that the way that they were using LSD was becoming irresponsible. And the way that the young people who then picked up their message and then started to use LSD was extremely ir irresponsible. But again, this is confession. I used LSD a few times during that period. And I don't consider it an intoxicant. It has a very, very interesting effect on the mind. Um, I think if one uses it persistently over a long time, it might have some detrimental effect, interfering with brain function. But it, for many people in my generation, it helped to open, sort of to break down the kind of narrow, fixed, Stabilize, stabilizing mindset that came out of the 1950s, the rigid way of conceptualizing and categorizing everything, sort of broke down all of those conceptual, rigid conceptual categories and opened the mind to the possibility of different dimensions to reality that we don't ordinarily perceive. So I would think under controlled conditions, the substances like this might be used prudently to, under very, very <coughs> careful supervision, responsible supervision, to alter people's minds and open them up to new sort of dimensions of reality, new ways of understanding. But then I would say that they would have the limited value that we can't expect these substances to really do for us the work that we have to do for ourselves. So it's just a way, I would think, of opening up somebody's mind to new possibilities and sort of setting them on the path. But then to actually tread the path, that's the work we have to do ourselves. I, I want to kind of follow up on the topic. I know other people have questions. Um, but I have, so I think of the substances, these mood-altering, mind-altering substances of three categories. This is my conception. There's the intoxicant, where you're actively trying to get high. Yeah. Then there's medicine, and some people can use cannabis as an anti-anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Attention yeah. is, you know, medicinal. Exactly, yeah. But then there's this other category, of a kind of mind expanding, a shamanic yeah. intention. Yeah. Which, you know, we don't have in Judeo-Christianity. Yeah. And I don't think it was there in Buddhism, but I'm curious if there was any, if there's any sense of that, that kind of shamanic uh, relationship to any sort of substance. Because I know when the, you know, you go back to the Brahmanic, the Vedic tradition, they had soma and yeah, such. And, yeah. and so. so is, is there any account of a, a kind of mind altering substance in the Buddhist text? In anything, yeah, I mean, in the Buddhist yeah. tradition generally. So, to my knowledge, no. No, not, none that I'm familiar with. And one other quick question. Is Except that in Sri Lanka, the Buddhist monks, they choose something called betel nut. Oh, oh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch what you said. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was in India for a bit. And yeah. Yes. It's uh, yeah. stimulating. I wrote a lot of papers on betel nut. Anyway. Um, <laughs> the other, people disparage the jhanas and some, some people in the Buddhist tradition in, in this, are jhanas yeah. considered maybe, you know, kind of a self-indulgent state yeah. by those who don't think the jhanas are worthy attainments? Yeah. Is that a, that's the question. Are they considered kind of an intoxicated, self-indulgent state? No, intrinsically not, no. It's, I mean, it's possible that the meditator who attains the jhanas can then become attached to the joy and bliss that are, occur within the jhanas. But first, that isn't, we wouldn't call that intoxication in the sense of, you know, the precept of abstaining from intoxicants. And then the fact that some meditators can be um, sort of swept up and become addicted or attached to the joy and bliss of the jhanas doesn't in any way detract from their importance and their value in the overall stru structure of the Buddha's training. What is their importance? What, what, is, their importance? I, 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 oh, what is their importance? Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. At this point, I haven't yet come to the path 
So we'll do the path tomorrow, and maybe if that question becomes relevant tomorrow, then we can bring it up. So in a way, this is jumping the gun. <laughs> it's just that he mentioned the jhanas as a source of maybe intoxication, so that's why I answered the question. Uh, with respect to ethics, uh, we, we don't want to kill and we don't want to kill animals. Yep. Um, and we normally think of that in terms of food, uh, but what about killing animals to save humans? So I work for a startup pharma company, and our goal is to make a medicine that will save lives. Yeah. But in order to do that, we, uh, we tested on animals, mice. Uh, I used yeah. proteins from rabbits, antibodies from other animals, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of, not directly in my work, but I know that behind the scenes, animals die so that we can get yeah. our drug to yeah. work. Uh, how does, is there a hierarchy in, in the ethics for people over animals uh, in Buddhism? Okay, the precept itself says that one takes the precept to abstain from taking life, both the taking the life oneself and also instructing others to kill. And no distinction is made within the precept itself between human beings and animals, but the way it's interpreted, say, in the commentarial tradition, they have gradations based on the qualities, the size of the being who's being killed, so that the karmic weight becomes heavier if it's non-human beings. The details of this, I have to say, are not so fresh in my mind, but like killing a large animal, say an elephant or a bear, would be considered to have a heavier karma weight than killing a rat or a, <laughs> a rat or what would be another kind of that little animal? And a rabbit. Oh, I, the ra you. rabbit occurred to me, but I didn't want to speak about killing rabbits. So <laughs> <laughs> mosquito or an ant. Yeah, of course, that fish. is really small. And fish. Okay, a fish, okay. A rat or a fish, a small fish. And then killing a human being is considered to be much more, much graver transgression than killing an animal, even a large animal. So this is like sort of the commentarial position, but this is a little bit different from, or quite different from the ethical conflict that arises from the question whether there are conditions that can justify you know, taking the life of animals in order to create, say, medicines that will save human lives. And I don't feel really qualified myself to enter into the thick of that kind of argument. But I know that there's an organization called Physicians for Responsible Medicine, which conducts campaigns against the use of animals, animal experimentation for producing medicines. And they might have sound arguments. I haven't looked at their arguments sound arguments in opposition to creating medicines in ways that inflict death on other animals, and yet in ways that don't in any way involve putting other human beings at risk of death. So this is an area that I, I just don't feel fully qualified to let it to make authoritative pronouncements about. Fair enough. Thank you. But do look in if you're interested into that Physicians for Responsible Medicine. The person who's like the chairman of that. Gee, his name escapes me, but he's a well-known physician. Okay, maybe we could take it this one more question. We could take that. Um. Are these texts actually written 
Well, they weren't written. Are they actually the words of the Buddha? Do you think, or do you think that uh, they were just kind of come up with over the intervening years between when you spoke and when they were written down? And does it even matter? If yeah. It doesn't matter. Is it good to just assume that they are? You know, whether this was actually spoken verbatim by the Buddha, that of course we can't say. But what we can say is that, well, what I would say is that what the Mangala Sutta is doing, just with single words and phrases, it's sort of bringing together a whole like bundle of pronouncements that were made by the Buddha on these topics. So it's almost like a summary, a very concise summary of statements made by the Buddha in greater detail that we can find in the prose, collections of the prose discourses. Okay, so maybe we should now do like the closing meditation of the evening. And this will be a meditation on loving kindness. <laughs> 